If unless you have to sell something today, nobody wants to sell anything today. They think tomorrow will be rosier. It's, it's the most unaffordable the single family home business has ever been, I think, in the history of the country. I like to say it's a hurricane over real estate right now. We're in the category five hurricane and it's sort of a black cloud hovering over the entire industry until we get some relief or some understanding of what the Fed's gonna do over the longer term. For billionaire real estate investor Barry Sternlich, the original plan was to be a lawyer. I did apply to law school because my mom wanted me to be a lawyer because my brother was a doctor. And then I got in and I said I wasn't going to go, <laughs> and she cried. <laughs> Instead, he got an MBA from Harvard and headed west to JMB Realty in Chicago. Sternlich was laid off during the real estate recession of the late 1980s. So he struck out on his own and started buying up apartment buildings and debt from the Resolution Trust Corporation, a federal agency formed to clean up the wreckage from the savings and loan crisis. But Sternlich is best known for building the hospitality giant Starwood Hotels and Resorts, which counted name brand chains like Weston, St. Regis, and Sheridan among its portfolio. I was 38. I now had a company with 120,000 employees in 80 countries and $9 billion of debt. So I'm like, what on earth did I just do? <laughs> he famously invented the W, which offered luxurious hip accommodations to the masses. I thought we could do a branded boutique, which nobody thought you could do. The first one was here in New York. Analysts from Prudential Securities, I'll never forget this, were walking through the lobby because what are you going to do when W doesn't work? And W worked. Uh, it, was, it was cool, but not ultra cool. It was comfortable, though. Starwood merged with Marriott in 2016 to create the world's largest hotel chain. And Sternlich is back to running the Starwood Capital Group and its $115 billion under management. It's not always an easy feat these days as office buildings sit vacant and the Federal Reserve is running up interest rates at the fastest pace in 40 years, a move Sternlich has criticized. They went straight vertical on rates. This had happened before. We saw rates go up three, 400 basis points, but it was more gradual. This was a direct, we got to stop this. Now, you've been critical, I think it's fair to say, of the Federal Reserve. You feel that they raised interest rates too much too quickly. Uh, what should they have done in response to COVID when COVID came along? Uh, I would say that um, I've, I'm empathetic to the situation of Jerome Powell because you have a government that's spending money hand over fist, and then you have the Fed trying to break an economy. And I'm critical of Powell because, as you may know, they use a portion of the data they use is quite lagging. And they didn't see inflation when it was here. And then when they showed up, they showed up late and big. They went straight vertical on rates. We had to increase rates. We should have done them much earlier. He shouldn't have had negative interest rates. He shouldn't have been buying mortgages into May of 22. That should have stopped so much earlier that we didn't need him to do that. But when he finally stopped, he went the other direction and he went so far so fast. And I'm saying, just wait. Your view is because of the kind of things you see coming, we will go into a recession in the United States in your view? Yeah and any way to avoid it at this point or not really? It's interesting, one of my friends had a meeting with one of the uh, governors recently, last week. And they're like, we hear all this noise about the real estate, but we don't see the issues. They're gonna come and there is going to be a serious credit contraction. The country in any asset class has not adjusted to that cost of capital yet, but it's coming. The economy will slow. You can see the numbers, CO confidence is down, consumer confidence is down. Retail sales are down. Uh, the service economy is wickedly strong. It feels like the last gasp before the, we actually settle into what should be a, what you'd expect to be. I hope it's a shallow recession. I hope he can pull that off. Normally, when you increase interest rates, you decrease GDP growth and you uh, yep. increase unemployment. Your point is unemployment's not going up because the statistics aren't really covering the people who are really being laid off. Uh, unemployment isn't going up because structurally interest rates aren't affecting the labor market the way they would normally affect the labor market. You have the offset in construction from the infrastructure bill, and you have the service sector, which is still recovering the pandemic, which normally would be tilting over. Let's go back to your beginning. So where were you born? Um, somewhere on Long Island, I think. Long Island, okay. <laughs> and where did you go to high school in Long Island? I went to, no, I moved to Connecticut when I was five or six with my parents. Um, and went to public high school, West Hill High School, like 2,000 kids. You did reasonably well. You went to Ivy League school, you went to Brown. Correct. And you were a superstar there, you were an athlete, or you were a great student. I think Brown was uh, 
it was a liberal arts college and Brown, I credit with teaching me how to think. I think I'm a generalist thinker. I think a lot of my job has, has evolved into being sort of thinking about trends and macro situations and trying to direct our investment strategy. You went to Harvard Business School, so what did you do that attracted Harvard Business School to you? Well, I, also, I, I got a job, when you don't know how to do anything, you become a consultant. So I got, my first job out of Brown was uh, Booz Allen, and I worked there for a year. I had some assignments, and, and then my roommate was working at arbitrage firm on Wall Street, and he was like, do you want to come here? And I'm like, yes, I want to go learn to trade. So. I traded the breakup of AT&T. I made a lot of money. They told me I get 10% of the profits I made for the firm. I could calculate how much money that was. That was a lot of money back in those days, a couple hundred thousand bucks. I think they paid me 50 and I said, I don't want to do this, this is not a fair. So I applied to two business schools. I got in, I never thought I'd get in. I didn't take a math course in college. And so I couldn't get a job on Wall Street coming out of HBS because I had no experience on being on the street. And, and they, I wound up getting an offer from Goldman Sachs in the real estate group. But I also got this phone call. I went to visit this firm I never heard of called JMB in Chicago. So I was intrigued and it seemed like a fun city and I thought I'd try something new, so I went to Chicago. So you were downsized by JMB. So did you call your mother and say, I should have gone to law school or what happened? <laughs> no, my, I was friendly downsized. My, my boss, Neil Bloom, said he'd invest in me in my new company, whatever it was. I, and I wasn't sure I wanted to do real estate, but I, it was the time of the, for, of the SNL crisis. And I decided, um, I'd met some people in the, over the last couple of years uh, at that time that said they'd back me. And I recruited a friend from business school who worked at the Trimble Crow Companies to be my partner because I was the acquisition guy and he'd be the operations guy. And um, we went out and bought um, 8,000 units, apartment units, because the only thing we could buy were apartments because we didn't have a lot of money. And um, we were very successful. We, we, in 18 months, we decided we'd sell the assets and we sold them to Sam Zell and tripled our money. So the company you started eventually became Starwood. Yep. Uh, Starwood is in many different businesses. Uh, you're in the lodging business, you're in the uh, lending business, you're in the investment in office building and residential business, right? Yeah. So you do these through different vehicles. So let's go through the lodging part first. Um, before you um, got too well known in the real estate world, you did make a very well-known real, real estate acquisition in hotels and lodging when you weren't that well-known. You bought Weston. Actually, maybe um, you were well-known then. No, after we sold those apartments to Sam, we said, what else should we buy? And because prices had run pretty far for apartments and we went to see a group called Westinghouse was having a going out of business sale. And I said, do you have any apartments? They said, no. I said, do you have any land? So we started buying land. They said, no. So do you have any hotels? And they said, yeah, this is a portfolio we have. We're, it's under contract to a group in Boston, but it hasn't closed yet. So I went to see that fellow, um, Chick Hill in Memphis, Tennessee, and I convinced him that we would be more fun. So I took control of the company by buying the debt um, and then folded in a whole bunch of our assets into that company and that became Starwood Hotels. We changed the name first to Starwood Lodging and it had $8 million market cap in three years, I think it was $5 billion. That company bought Weston Hotels in 95, which we actually had bought privately with Goldman Sachs and we took it public, we bought it into Starwood Hotels now we were a $7 billion company, and in 1998, I made a bid for ITT Sheridan, um, which was a $14 billion company. When I was 38, I now had a company with 120,000 employees in 80 countries and $9 billion of debt. So I'm like, what on earth did I just do? <laughs> um, you built uh, one of the largest hotel and lodging companies in the world. The biggest the in the world based on cash flow. But you ultimately sold it. I left, I kind of done everything I wanted to do. I'd launched and started W Hotels. I turned St. Regis into a brand. And I kind of wanted to go back to the private world. I was tired of being a public company CEO, so I left um, and went back to Starwood Capital Group, and then that business uh, took off and grew. So do you come up with the ideas for these new hotel concepts? Do you yeah, have experts to help you? Okay. No, I do that. So uh, what was the idea behind Baccarat? I, I'm familiar with, so it was a luxury kind of brand. Yep. And Instant brand recognition. And W was more hip. Yeah, at the time, I was friends with Ian Schrager, and he'd done these hotels, but like the Mondrian, the Delano, but they were one-offs. And I thought we could do a branded boutique, which nobody thought you could do. The first one was here in New York. It opened in uh, 1998, I think it was. And um, it's the W on Lex behind the Waldorf. Um, and the analysts from Prudential Securities, I'll never forget this, were walking through the lobby, because what are you gonna do when W doesn't work? And W worked, uh, it, was, it was cool, but not ultra cool. It was comfortable though, it was supposed to be comfortable and, there was, and I outsourced restaurants to real restaurateurs 
offending the entire hotel industry. What's the appeal to you of the lodging industry? You like the creativity of creating the brands or what is it? And is the industry in good shape now? People coming back and going to hotels again because travel's back? Well, it's a place where I can express my own creativity. I entered real estate for that because I wanted to, I wanted to, it, you know, it's a physical expression. I built, we built the Baccarat here in New York. Um, so it's fun to see your, your vision come to life. Everyone says, you know, survive till 25. Hold on to your assets, sell. So transaction volumes have plummeted. Nobody's trying, unless you have to sell something today, nobody wants to sell anything today. They think tomorrow will be rosier. The market for office real estate remains in a state of disrepair. The popularity of hybrid work combined with a recent wave of layoffs has sent demand for office space plunging, and vacancy rates are on the rise. In the first quarter of 2023, 12.9% of office space in the U.S. sat vacant, according to data from CoStar Group. That's an all-time high. McKinsey estimates that the shift to work from home could wipe out $800 billion from the value of global office buildings in major cities by 2030. And for investors in these office towers, the old playbook isn't working. Those deals were largely fueled by easy access to cheap debt, and skyrocketing interest rates makes it harder and more expensive to refinance. Now, those loans are coming due, roughly $1.4 trillion worth between 2023 and 2024, according to the Mortgage Bankers Association. There are signs of promise amid the grim outlook, though. According to real estate firm Jones Lang LaSalle, office leasing rebounded 7.7% from the first to second quarter this year. However, those gains are still well below the pre-pandemic average. So let's talk about your uh, other business, which is the non-lodging business. So you are one of the best known and one of the best real estate investors in our country. Um, right now, many people think the real estate market's gonna be in trouble because high interest rates are making it more and more difficult for people to service their loans and we're gonna have a lot of defaults soon. What do you think about that observation? Anything with a fixed income stream is worth less when rates rise. And the underlying fundamentals in most of the asset classes in real estate are okay right now in the United States. The apartment market, the industrial logistics market, the hotel markets, those are all in good shape. But there's no question that the Fed has reacted dramatically to try to slow the economy down quite late, obviously. And um, that has impacted real estate values. Yields on properties are moving up to reflect this higher interest rate. And, and the supply of credit to the industry is curtailed dramatically. So um, it, it's, I like to say it's a hurricane over real estate right now. We're in the category five hurricane and it's sort of a black cloud hovering over the entire industry until we get some relief or some understanding of what the Fed's gonna do over the longer term. COVID had the effect of letting people work at home. So now people that uh, are saying, come back to work, come into your offices, and a lot of employees are saying, I'd rather work at home. So people are begging them to come in two days, three days a week. So is this going to mean in the end that we're going to change the way office buildings are really valued in the future because they're not going to need as much space for their, for their tenants? Do you think that's true? Or do you think eventually the tenants will come back and the employees will come back? First of all, the work from home phenomenon is a U.S. phenomenon. If you go to England or Germany, and I was just, we have some investments offshore, and I was just looking at it. rents are up and vacancy rates in the top Europe, German property markets, Berlin, Frankfurt, Munich, Hamburg are less than 5%. People are back in the office. You and I go to the Middle East, they're full. We have offices in Asia, they're full. So this is a US situation. In the US, you have two markets. You have the really nice buildings that are ESG compliant, that are lovely, like the one we're sitting in, this place is buzzing, and they're back. Because it's a fun place to be. And if you're in a building with lots of cubicles and it's dark and there's no life and love, so nice buildings, even in a city as, as currently destitute as San Francisco from an office market perspective, the best buildings are still leased. And so you're gonna see a bifurcation of the market in office. The nice buildings will stay rented, and my guess is at pretty good rates. And the B and C stuff is gonna be maybe fields of grain or something. It'll be very pretty. We'll have all these little mid-block parks in New York City because there won't be anything else to do with those buildings. And nobody will carry them because there's no hope. Some of the cities that have issues on commuting, like New York or LA downtown, 
LA downtown, San Francisco, the CBD, that are difficult to commute to, that's where the pressure's so hard from workers saying, I don't wanna drive into the city an hour and a half and drive home an hour and a half every day. But I also think a nice little recession will clear this and you'll see people come back to the office. And I was in your town, take the Amazon HQ2, they're expecting people in those offices four days a week come the fall. So the other thing about office, David, is AI. AI is gonna hit a couple of these industries that have been big users of office space. You think artificial intelligence is obviously coming, but what industries do you think will be most affected? Legal is probably the number one industry that could be disrupted by AI. You can, you can search every precedent in the history of mankind with a machine. You don't need a paralegal to do that anymore. And they'll write the brief for you. So the legal profession is probably target one, not far behind is advertising, when the machine is gonna update advertising and keep bombarding you with more and more ads, with more and more offers until you take one. So humans won't be there. They'll be maybe guiding it, but it'll, be, it'll change advertising. It's another big user of space, finance. You tell me, I mean, there's buttons now on your computer, they'll be running a lot of the stuff for you. So it's, it's, it could fundamentally shake up permanent demand for office. Now, sometimes people are saying that the best investment opportunity now is to stress real estate debt, that you can buy the, the debt from banks at a discount and so forth, but you think it's too early for that? They're just beginning to, you know, we were gonna give back an office building and they said, well, not so fast. <laughs> if you wanna, we'll restructure the loan and we'll cut it, the loan in half and you put the money in here and we'll take this as a junior note because the banks don't want the assets back. And, and Why don't they want them back? Because they think it's gonna go down they, even further? They, yeah, because they gotta carry them. They're not set up to carry these assets, right? And they gotta go hire someone, they gotta go the leasing themselves. It's not their business, they'd rather have a, a GP like your old firm Carlisle or Starwood or Blackstone hold on to the asset and try to work it out. So a lot of fortunes were made in the real estate world in 07, 08 when people bought distressed real estate and all in the late 80s too yep. when the RTC was here. So do you see funds being formed to buy these assets but you think they won't be available for a year or two? Well, right now you have an unusual situation in the real estate markets because everyone's sort of looking at the yield curve and it says rates will be lower later. Everyone says, you know, survive till 25. Hold on to your assets. So, so transaction volumes have plummeted. Nobody's trying, if, unless you have to sell something today, nobody wants to sell anything today. They think tomorrow will be rosier. So for the most part, everybody's pushing any sales back. And I think transaction buys in apartments are down 60%, industrial down 70%. It's, gonna, it's a very dry, you know, there's no IPOs and there's no sales. In housing. Do you see a recession there because prices are going to come down at some point, or you don't see a recession in housing? I, I think um, the housing market's had a very unusual situation where Powell's um, increase in rates has diminished supply. And people, I'm not sure we've ever had a situation where so many people have locked in, the house, have locked in their mortgage costs. So right now, people are sticking in their house, which has diminished the supply of homes for sale. I wonder when rates come down, Homes will be sold, like people will start, because the, the mortgage will no longer be a reason to hold on to the house. And whether that will offset will probably be an increase in supply um, as the builders resume, resume a more normal cycle. So maybe the housing market just stagnates for a while, but it, it, over time it's headed up. All right, let's suppose I'm gonna invest in real estate and I'm not a wealthy person, but I have some money. Should I buy a, a, a publicly traded uh, share in a REIT? You, you operate a REIT. Uh, REIT business, two is REITs. that right, one two public REITs. and one private. All right, are, yeah. is that a good business to be in, in terms of, of operating it? Is it a good thing for people to now invest in a REIT? Yeah, I, look, I think real estate has a, has a nice place in the balance sheet of any individual. But I think the REITs in general in here will look really interesting. And we, we in the pandemic, we raised a special situations fund and bought 15 names in the REIT business. And we were up like 70% at one point. Um, we're going to do that again. We, I think if you take a long-term view, some of these good companies are, they're good companies with the wrong interest rate environment. I, even, I wouldn't even say they have the wrong balance sheet, but they are so out of favor. All you, every day you pick up, you turn on the news and real estate, real estate, real estate. There's some really good buys out there. The human nature, even in running a stock portfolio, is to take your gains and hold your losses, hoping they come back to par. And the same thing applies to real estate. You were based in the northeast part of the United States uh, for much of your career. 
but uh, you picked up and moved to Miami. Mm. Uh, why did you do that a few years ago? And um, any regrets about moving to Miami? My mom's down there and I got divorced. That was uh, one reason, change your life, start over. Um, there was obviously a tax benefit to doing so and I would sold an interest in my firm at the time. I was based in Connecticut, I was based in Greenwich, our headquarters. Um, but at that time, there. before COVID, people said, Barry, you're moving to another yeah. part of the world. Yeah. Was that people thinking you were a little bit strange? Well, I, I, yes, they did. I didn't think it'd be that hard to move and make that my base of operations. It turned out I caught the wave perfectly. I was a, an early settler into Miami and, you know, the home prices probably tripled there. I should have just bought all, I shouldn't have traveled the world. I should have bought everything with my house. I would have had the best performing real estate fund in the world. The President of the United States calls you and says, Barry, you're a smart guy. I need a Secretary of Treasury who knows real estate and, <laughs> uh, you know, who's a Democrat. I assume you're a Democrat. I put myself as an independent right independent, now. <laughs> okay. But if a president, any president of any party then called you, would you ever go into government or you're, you're a private sector person? No, I, I would serve the nation. I would. I, I think that, that, you know, I do think the government could use a few business people in it, despite the lack of love we may have for us. I think the government has to treat itself a little like a corporation. They have a budget and they have limited resources now. You have a $32 trillion deficit. So you have to figure out what you need to get done versus what you'd like to get done. There are so many benefits to being unemployed now. There's so many support systems that I think some people say, I'll work part-time and collect my unemployment benefits. 31% of our housekeepers we cannot find. And we're paying, we're paying $15 an hour. We used to be paying nine and now we're, and there are benefits and they don't, they're not there, they're not there. So we, those people are probably some of these people that may be hanging out on unemployment ranks or getting all kinds of subsidies. And we need the government to say, if, you're, if you have a hardship and we understand we'll help you, we'll, but we should educate people, we should get train them for jobs and bring them back to a productive society. What is the best investment advice you've ever received? Hmm. Um, I, I was talking to one of the most successful hedge fund managers in the United States and, and, and he said, I expected him to tell me about some horrific investment he made and he lost all his money. He said, not selling my winners too early. And I think about that all the time. Human nature, even in running a stock portfolio, is to take your gains and hold your losses hoping they come back to par. And the same thing applies to real estate. You know, we, we, we want, oh, we got a high IRR on this deal, we'll sell this asset, pocket the 47 IRR, and our, our bad deals, we'll just, hopefully, they'll, we'll make our money back. And we, you know this from, from Carlisle, we spent all our time on the bad deals. And, and so I think that has been, um, we had a portfolio, a company that we were gonna sell, and we made $900 million, and I said, we're not selling it. My partners were furious. Um, but this one, I, I had done this deal, so I said, I'm holding this, and we sold it four years later and made a billion four. All right, what do you think the most common mistake that investors make, the average investor, most common mistake? That, they sell their gains too they soon. And they, they sell they, too they, soon, okay. And they hold on, they don't cut their losses, and they hope things will get better when hope is not a business strategy. So if your mother came to you and said, I have $100,000, I need to invest it somewhere, where should I invest it? You would say, where, real estate? Well, today, I mean, if you look at my portfolio, I mean, I have a significant amount of cash that I never had before because I'm getting 5% for the cash. So as you look back on your career, what would you say you're most proud of? It's building one of the biggest real estate uh, companies in the United States and the world. Um, your philanthropic activities, your children, what is it you're most proud of having achieved? We start with my kids. I mean, I'm happy with my three children. Um, that's your legacy, really. Uh, for me, building Starwood Hotels, not only were we the best performing large cap hotel company of the 10 years I ran the company. I won uh, best lodging executive in the country in Institutional Investor Magazine, displacing I think six years that Bill Marriott had that award. Um, but I built a company with a good soul. And that was the untold story of Starwood because we had to do, I said I wanted our hotels to be the shining light in each community we served. And I made our people give back to the communities.